episode 110 of the Kaisen Talk Podcast. This is the first episode of 2022, so welcome Adrian, Dr. Adrian Cohen, or Adrian Lohan, and uh, we'll get to talk to him in a second. And for first, I would like to thank my sponsor, Head Check Health. Concussion Talk Podcast is presented by Head Check Health. Head Check Health bridges the gaps in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. To run organizations like the Canadian Football League, Track Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Volleyball Canada, who rely on Head Check Health to improve communication and optimize care. Visit HeadCheckHealth.com for more. I'd also like to to thank uh, or to ask you to please follow me on all social media at Concussion Talk. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at Concussion Talk. Um, the the podcasting app, Good Pods, Concussion Concussion Talk there, and on Patreon at patreoncom slash Concussion Talk. And you know, to follow this podcast wherever you have podcasts. And so please subscribe, rate, and review. And uh, so now, welcome, Adrian, Dr. Adrian Cohen. And uh, I, I was not invited, but encouraged to contact you or you, Dr. My previous guest, Dr. David Cancel of Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, wanted to introduce me to you to talk about NeuroCheck. So could you please? Explain what is NeuroCheck and also what is visual evoke potential and guess what? How the EEG, EEG really makes a difference there. It's, it's important to the, neuro, the NeuroCheck system that you, to, that you had developed. Delighted to be here. I mean, you know, I am an Australian. We're a long way away from you at the moment, but hey, we have yes. the same problems. And your brain doesn't care what side of the planet you're on. It doesn't care whether it's in the, the front line of a scrimmage or the front seat of an automobile. It's, or what hemisphere? You've got one, and they all work the same. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, I'm a sports doctor. I've been uh, in and around rugby in particular for most of my career, which is about 30 years. And I got particularly interested in pre-hospital medicine, which is the stuff that doctors mostly don't do. We're used to seeing people in clinics or in hospitals and nice, well-lit surroundings with lots of resources around. I worked in a rescue helicopter program where we were the ones that went out to where the accidents and injuries happened, including head wow. and spinal cord injuries. Wow. So my my background is the hands-on stuff on the ground and yeah. being the first person there, not the guy with the most expensive machine in the hospital. Yeah. Now, along the line of this, uh, I created a charity called Neurosafe, which is dedicated to the elimination of preventable head and neck injury. So uh-huh. elimination and preventable being the keys through education, research, raising awareness and most importantly, through advocacy, changing people's minds, and research helps us do that. I used, uh, as a doctor, you know, we started a, the Sports Brain Bank in Australia, the same as uh, the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Actually, yeah, my, uh, my one of my previous guests, episode 104, was Alan Pierce. Absolutely. So, um, you know, Alan's involved with that here in Australia. My yeah. My friend Chris Lewinsky, Anne McKee. Um, and Robert Cern, of course, in Boston, and the Canadian chapter as well. So this is a worldwide phenomena because yeah. this is a worldwide problem. And in the old days, they used just to say, hey, you know, we don't see CTE in Australia. And I said, no, 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 it's not that we don't see, it's that we don't look. Yeah. So we have looked, and we, of course, we have found. But as the doctor that's at the sideline trying to make these assessments, um, I was particularly interested in, in the tool chest. You know, what have I got to make this? I mean, I went through medical school. I got told how to do a neurological um, examination and I think I can yeah. really tell when someone's awake or asleep and I was particularly in the pre-hospital environment used to dealing with life-threatening emergencies where yeah. people who are, you know rapidly trying to bleed out on you or who've got um, significant brain injuries such that it's a life-threatening emergency you know you need to know how to do the resuscitation way down the spectrum is concussion because it's not immediately life-threatening but it can have long-term consequences Certainly. so as part of our education program for the the charity neurosafe we created a program for spinal awareness called neck safe and a program for education and awareness of head injuries called head safe that's the and that's the side i'm looking at it now the head safe yeah, and we've, um, Exactly. And we've been mirroring what's happening in uh, all over the world in terms of providing educational resources and the best information possible. Yeah. And from the research side of things, that involved actually 
uh, in spinal cord injury, looking at different ways of handling people, and in head injury, ways of examining and I'm going to use this word a lot, objectively yeah. measuring concussion when it happens. Because all the tests we know are subjective. Ask them some questions. Who's the, who's the president? You know, what did you have for breakfast? What day of the week it is? And yeah. we know people can uh, answer appropriately or inappropriately depending on if they feel like it. So if we give them the chance to change their answer or we're doing one of the neurocognitive tests that are out there, of yeah. course they can perform well or better depending on how they feel or what they are trying to to portray as the way yeah. they feel. So that's really important that we realize that this isn't something we should leave up to interpretation. So I went back into the scientific tool chest and started reading the literature. And I went to the international conferences. I went to the concussion in sports group in the last meeting they had in Berlin and to the World Rugby um, toured America and went to various places there and looked at what was happening in concussion. The bottom line is all the tools were pretty blunt. So this sports concussion assessment tool, which for sports replaces what I used to do, say in the ER for the neuro neurological examinations, has a whole lot of questions and balanced tests and things that nobody understands. The doctors doing them don't understand them very well. The patients don't understand them. The players who are subjected to them. And when you try and present this research to people, they don't get it because they don't understand the tests. So I looked at all the other things that were being done, the electronic test. We used balance testing with a little accelerometer that went behind the ear for um, three seasons. We measured that in rugby union footballers and rugby league footballers. And of course, that tells us what goes into each collision, but it doesn't tell us the outcome because everybody's different. And it's, uh, it's great you mentioned Alan Pierce because he's a leading Australian um, neuro researcher. And yeah. one of the technologies he uses is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Yeah, we always have that briefly in the news. Yeah, which is a way of, it's a way of stimulating the motor nerves of the brain and measuring how they react. Now, the good thing about that is that you can't prepare for that and you can't alter the outcome. Yeah. It's a physiological function of how you are when you are tested. But these motor event potentials or motor electrical currents, if you want to call them that, are just one of a whole lot of electrical activity going on in the brain. We've, our neck top computer runs on electricity. You know, we've got one nerve talking to another by electric signal going down and we get to that synapse yeah. where neurochemical transmitters go across the synapse and then an electrical impulse goes down there. So electricity is fundamental to what we do. Yeah. And motor evoke potentials are one way of measuring that. But there are other ones too. Visual evoke potentials, acoustic evoke potentials vestibular remote potentials you know even the senses of smell the organs there that pick up smells transmit that information through evoke potentials electrical activity so i looked at all of those and decided that um so, so sorry so so potential potential just means electrical activity exactly exactly yeah. electric yeah. potential the difference between plus and minus yeah. in millivolts at one end and the that's the kind of the signal stream and so i went back into these because as a doctor just working in sport. This was all interesting stuff that I'd done at university. But I, you know, I wasn't fluent in it. I'm not a career neuroscientist. I'm yeah. not a researcher for a living. I've had to become all of that along this way. So going back and revisiting made me realize that the problem with a lot of these tests were they were expensive. They had to be done in hospitals. They took an hour. So when I was going through medicine, visual evoke potentials were used for, for the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. If you're worried and you weren't quite sure of the diagnosis, you sent one up to the, have a VEP test, the visual of a potential test. They sat in a room for an hour with all 32 electrodes on their head for the EEG that measures the brain's electrical activity. The lights were yep. flashed up on the screen. You had a football field's length of chart paper come out from all of that. And once every two weeks, the clever neurologist or the clever neurophysiologist came along with a pair of calipers, literally measured peaks, graphs and distances and said, you've got MS or you haven't got MS. A couple yeah. of years after that, so this is the mid-80s, a couple of years after that, our very good friends at Siemens and Fujitsu and General Electric came along and said, hey, listen, we'll show you MS. Buy one of these $10 billion CT scanners and we can show it to you. Yeah. We can actually show thickenings of nerves. We can show anatomical distortions of the brain that correlate with MS. So hospitals did that. VEPs got less and less and less used. They're, they're used for some rare neurology and some retinal diseases until we came along. Because the problem with that scanning technology, and we went from CT to magnetic resonance imaging, all those kinds of stuff, is they don't show concussion. 
Concussion's mm-hmm. not a big obvious thing like a bleed in the brain or a congenital abnormality or a tumor, which is where we use these imaging technologies. Concussion happens right down at the level of the cells. We can't image cells. We don't have a microscope or an external tool that's got enough resolution to show that. And we might one day, we might be able to sit on the side on the outside and zoom down on individual nerves after a, an impact that we think is a concussion. Go, oh, look, the cell structure's been disrupted. That tau yeah. protein leaked out that later is associated with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, as we know. Oh, look, there's too much tau around there. Or we might go the metabolic activity of that cell's changed and it's not able to handle the flux of sodium, potassium, calcium as it normally would. These are the hallmarks of what's actually going on in the pathophysiology of concussion, yeah. but we've got no way of seeing it. So until such time as we can see it, you know, you think again, how do we make diagnosis in other systems? Well, we cut some tissue and look under the microscope, right? We're not doing that with your brain. Don't worry. No one's running out with a scalpel onto the football field anytime soon and taking a bit of your brain and bunging it under the microscope. That's but what we can do is measure the electrical activity, which changes as a result of what's going on at that pathophysiological level. And that's what we did. We took the VEP technology, we miniaturized it and turned it into a headset that can be worn and a test that takes five minutes, not two hours. And it can be done at the sideline, it can be done in the surgery, it can be done in the ER, it can be done in the back of an ambulance. And our whole thesis in this is, similar to what's been found in those other evoked potentials, is that the visual evoked potential changes when you've got concussion and it goes back to normal as you get better. It's a transient effect. Now, of course, it lasts longer in some people and the more damage that's done, the longer term those consequences can be until you actually get irreparable damage. We see that as autopsy as CTE, but along the way, there's a whole lot of nuance with people who are not as good as they should be at the age they are. And we want to be able to pick that up. How do we do that? We've got a research. So the research projects that we've started uh, with Mount Sinai Hospital three years ago with um, David Cancel and Dr. David Petrino in the rehab department there yes. ha- has been in studying these concussions and our device has been cleared by the FDA as a neurological test. That's fantastic. The next level of clearance we're doing is specifically you know, as an aid to diagnosis. We're not making these claims yet any more than we're saying we can tell you how far you're on to getting CTE until we've got the research to support it. So there's multiple projects going on using a technology which we've deliberately designed to be low cost, so it is affordable to be used at the sideline and in GP surgeries, and it can become ubiquitous. It's not just going to be in the big hospitals and you're going to spend hours flying there to be tested. We want this to be out there, available to everybody. You can kind of actually see the how purple, you can obviously see how purple it is, but how just how not say expensive and, and daunting it is to purchase because of the video that you have on your side about the just to, to, him, to the short version for it um, that shows just a person carrying the neurocheck system with one hand and just just uh, just uh, one hand that cramped by the side, just a strap that goes around the head and uh, the eyes are blacked out by the goggles of visor is or whatever you call it. Exactly. exactly. And, uh, it weighs about a pound. And look, this is exactly. virtual reality. You're not shooting yeah. hoops or landing an airplane. Yeah. You're flashing a light of a specific sequence in your eyes. The sensors that we have on the back pick up your brain's resulting electrical activity, send it by secure Bluetooth to a smartphone for analysis right there, and to the cloud for secure storage. Okay. So does does it go just to, does it go to the directly to a, say, a health provider or to a, after, to a doctor? Or? After all of that, you could be looked at right there by the doctor who's assessing you at the time or an athletic trainer. And that record is then being able to be transmitted or accessed by the doctor. Say that at a tertiary institution, when they're at the big hospital or a sports yeah. clinic or wherever, they can look at it up at the phone if they happen to be there when they took it. Or they can, you know, like we're all used to doing with medical stuff these days, they can access the record through a secure... HIPAA compliant portal, pull it down and look at the reading on the screen in front of them. And that helps them make a diagnosis. So, so where is this, where's this being like used right now? What sort of, uh, where do you, where, where is it being used or where do you intend it to be used? But ultimately, um, we want this to be as available as the EKG machine. You know, think about a parallel history, if you like, for a moment. In the early days, 
the EKGs and defibrillators were only in research institutions, and then they came into intensive care units, then they came into the ER, and then the ambulance and the local doctor. Now there's a defibrillator, you know, an EKG, um, yeah. literally in every building. Definitely. So we want to see the same sort of democratization of this technology too. We want to go from research, you know, at a very high level and labs into hospital use into something that can be used in every EMS system, at every road accident, every time an elderly person falls in a nursing home. We want it to be used in the sporting field and we want it to be used by healthcare providers who are looking after these people as well to help them make better decisions. Initially deciding, for instance, in concussion, once the data is there to be able to demonstrate whether this is concussion or not, how long the person should be rested. And then equally, if the person is demonstrating changes to their normal electrophysiology, we want to wait till they get better and use our same neurocheck device to say, hey, it's back to where it should be or where it was for you. Remembering this is always very personalized medicine. Yeah. You don't want to just make generalizations and say, hey, it's 10 days off the field for you. It's, you know, we don't want to say that. We want to say you're good to go when you're good to go. So let's measure that objectively and make sure we're not allowed allowing any further damage to be done because each time there's an impact there's damage each time somebody goes back to early there's more damage and in fact that's personified in a disease called second impact syndrome yeah when you send particularly a child back to sport before they're ready and this doesn't happen very often but when it does happen it's tragic oh yeah so a, they, know, they may not go home to mom and dad yeah so in, this happened firstly to a a 14 year old in um, washington state and the law that was brought in to make sure that people were being monitored properly bears his name, the Lysted law. Zachary Lysted was, was the kid that was sent back onto the field after a concussion. So yeah. in Canada, it was a 15-year-old girl playing yeah. rugby. Her name is yeah. Ellen Stringer. Yes. And she was sent back onto the sporting field when her brain hadn't returned to normal. And she died yeah. as a result of that. Yeah. And that's a tragedy when that happens in our young people. Yeah. It's a tragedy when it happens in our older people too. Exactly. It's a tragedy when we let people whose brains have been injured that haven't that haven't had the chance to repair, we send them back out to, to play. We send them back out to battle in our military. We send them back out to work in our workplaces where if we understood what was going on objectively, we could make sure that they're at their best and therefore the potential for damage was less. So do you do you talking about the objective to make sure that the brain is back normal by objective standards? Do you do you, uh, do you ascribe to the uh, the the whole the, whole, the uh, baseline data baseline information first? Or do you need would you need the nurse system on just anybody first? All to see what their leg like, heads like normally, and then to the heads like after. Great observation because a lot of the tests are out there at the moment need to do a baseline to start with, and then we compare you to your baseline. And what's been learned, of course, is that athletes sandbag or cheat on their baseline. Yeah. They can. yeah. So when they know the test, of course, they try and make themselves look worse when they're baseline so that if they have an injury, they don't look as bad. Yeah. That's so well acknowledged. It's a wonder that any tests that use that kind of subjective methodology are even still out there. Hey, but hey, they are. They've been around a long time and people yeah. are resistant to change. We started looking at baselines and comparing them from to when people were injured as part of our data set. But then we threw that information into a really complex machine learning model. Because what we want to do is take all the features of a concussion in your, in your case, so it's all very individualized, and be able to make that determination without doing a baseline. So we're looking for baseline free reading uh, on the, on, and using the data and a machine learning model in the background of all this to get us that. And you were you were saying you uh you do you were you were partnered with not Sinai Hospital. You also mentioned before that you partnered with Baylor and and other universities as well in the, in the state in the U.S. and I guess I guess in other countries as well. But where where have you uh, where have you done your research? Start partnered to research the. CD aspect of this. So yeah, clearly the US is um, you know, the largest market, and to a certain extent the furthest ahead as well. Europe's fast catching up, so we ultimately aim to be in Europe as well. But you know, as a as a proud Australian, we've done doing our research here in Australia. We yeah. have a research project at the University of Waikato in New Zealand. And we actually have an American PhD student who's attached to that project there. So Australia, New Zealand, um, we're looking to um, also to Houston. 
Uh, we've got uh, Baylor College of Medicine there, and we've just started a research project with the University of Texas at the Herman Hospital Ironman Sports Medicine Center Concussion Institute. Um, so that's they're very well known. I mean, you know, yeah, of course, Texas is big for football, but yeah. right across their their healthcare systems, they see lots and lots of people, and that gives us the opportunity to get the data to take to the FDA and make sure that you know we can back up the claims that we're making. There's a lot of there's a lot of air in the space. There's a lot of promises. We want to do things properly. We realize how important it is through um, the FDA process to make sure that we are making claims that we can validate. And you said that you, this is almost a prevent, uh, most a brand, but pre-injury type of a double non-diagnosed type of treatment. So, but you're you're working with uh, Dave Pacino. I don't know his name. First name is Dave. David Cancel, Doctor Cancel, and Doctor Pacino of the. But they're in the rehab, the rehab unit of Mount Sinai. So how does that? How what what are they? What do they? How do they use NeuroCheck in the rehab setting? So what we're doing at Mount Sinai and a number of these other studies is seeing people after they've had a concussion, making the readings that we take there are all designed to help our machine learning model okay. actually validate the fact they've been concussed. Right. Now, once we've been able to do that, and you know, a number of the projects we're working at here in Australia and New Zealand and other sites, we're at the sideline as well. So we want to see people as soon after their concussion as possible, so we can measure them, at, you know, literally at, at the sideline in the change rooms, um, out of the away from the crowd, clearly as they're being assessed initially. Because getting that, getting that assessment right initially is really important. It means they go into a, a treatment protocol that starts by resting them and gradually increasing exercise and making sure they're okay before they go back. But in the bad old days, it was just, hey, shake it off. You know, it's tougher in my day. Yeah. You know, this, this, this will make a tougher player, both for men and for women playing contact sports. Yeah. And so it was either ignored or belittled or played down or there wasn't anyone there that could make that determination. So, you know, it's like if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, did it actually happen? Well, of course, these concussions have been happening and all the stats are based around how many people present to hospital with a diagnosis. There's 10 times that many people that have a concussion that never even get to hospital where they're not properly assessed. So we want to make sure that people are looked after by using a technology that can actually help get that objective decision made so that the person can be appropriately treated. And the first thing, of course, is that they don't go back to playing or to training on that day. And ideally, that they don't go back until they're ready. So we need to be able to help make those measurements to let the individual, their parents, their friends, their colleagues, their team, their sport, their league, whatever, make sure that they're being looked after as best as possible. Which is actually about that, because that, that leads right to my next, next question. Dr. Dr. Cancel was just on the podcast and he was he, the, the, last, the last podcast I did, was a 109. Um, he, he's, a, he's a rep, I don't know if you went to any matches of Ref for boxing, taekwondo, and jujitsu, other combat sports in New York State, and then he, he's not the ref. He's sorry, he's a medical physician on on site. So, just would if he does he he wants he would want to use that on the side. Would you like to see that on the side side of sidelines of MMA, jujitsu, boxing? Definitely. That's, that's Definitely. Right. So, you know, we said before, your brain doesn't care whether it's in a, whether it's in a car wreck, whether it's in a scrimmage, or whether it's in a boxing room or an MMA fight. Yeah, it's the same brain. It's the same. And I, I look at concussion and brain damage. This is an energy disease. We're transferring energy from the outside world to the brain. The brain's only got a limited amount of, of cushioning. It's only got a limited amount of capacity to actually deal with that. And then it tells that it doesn't want to play anymore. Now, when we look at our combat sports, of course, you know, we, we see professional fights and we sort of think everything's done at that highly professional standard and there's three doctors by the ringside and 12 camera angles and all that. Yeah. We all know there are gyms where there's amateur boxing and where there's less yeah. rigorous rules and where, you know, an MMA that starts in the local... Yeah. Country, not as many cameras. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, you know, it's not just when people come to fight. It's, not, it's being able to help make that decision when they need to step out of the ring and when they need to qualify but it's also making sure that they're, they're suitable to step into the ring because we know for instance with fighters that they will tailor their training to their fight they will increase the amount of sparring they're all doing they'll increase you know they'll try and toughen up before a fight it may yeah. well be that we have fighters getting into the ring who right. are concussed before they start who have damage that hasn't had a chance to heal because of the nature of what they're doing 
Now, I'm, you know, openly comfortable declaring that I'm not a fan of combat sports. Yeah. But I know they're part of our society. So I can just sit here as a well-intentioned doctor and say, oh, just ban them all. It's barbaric. That's not going to work. And that's not realistic. What we have to do is make any sport, any activity as safe as possible. And that comes through knowledge and appropriate intervention so that that individual understands the short, medium and long-term consequences of their participation. So education is critical. Giving them good information is even more important. And having the governing bodies recognise that not only is that in the individual's best interest, it's actually in that activity's best interest as well. If you want to save sport, you do the right thing by it. You don't put your head in the sand and pretend the problem doesn't exist. You acknowledge it and you show you're doing all the things that need to be done. In the NFL's case, when you look at the multi-billion dollar now lawsuit that they settled, there were three things that came out of that. You didn't educate us. That's now happening. We get that. You didn't take us off the field when we needed to. Yeah. When we were injured, you didn't take us off. You made us play on. And more importantly, you sent us back to play before we were ready. Yeah. That's exactly what we're trying to address here. Not to stop the sport. We're here to make sports safer by being better informed. And you can say who you like that, you know, professional footballers are getting, making hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. They, they know the risks. That's a very small tip of the iceberg at their professional level. And some of them may decide, you know what? I don't know, care what happens down the track. I need to make this for my friends, my family, and to look after my, my, my people. And I've got a short window to do it. I've got two or three years to do it before my knee blows out. And if I get a few hits to the head, I don't have to worry about that until later on. Sadly, there's a lot of those people doing a lot of that worry now. There are a lot of people in a world of hurt following wherever their concussion was sustained, wherever their brain injury happened, wherever they weren't looked after enough, well enough to start with and were sent back too early, that are suffering longer term. And perhaps if they knew more about it, they would make different choices. That's a, just I think that's an excellent point, strong point to end on. And uh, just want to thank you so much for for being on, doing doing this podcast and t- t- teaching us all about educating us about neurotech, uh, this this system. So, is there anything else about this system that you would like us to know about the neurotech system or about HeadSafe in general? We've got a website that tells you all about it. You're right. It's HeadSafe.com. And, you know, we want to be at the forefront of making a difference. We believe that this technology can actually move the dial. The key is objective assessment. Make it portable. Make it affordable. Let's do the most good for the most number. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Again, another another strong point to end on. And uh, is there anywhere, any place people can reach you? Uh, so I know in those HeadSafe, there's a connect page on HeadSafe. That's the best way to people contact HeadSafe and contact you. Questions are, hey, oh, oh, hh hey, Nick, one day you can make the trip to Australia. Turn up at my door. I'll give you a call. I'll, I would love to. I'd, I'm dying to make the trip to Australia, but of course, we've got uh, this this whole COVID thing and Omicron and all that. I don't know. No, this, this goes out in 2022. Who knows what it'll be then? But uh, when 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 I can, though, I would definitely would love to be on the head of Australia. Check it out. And if Right. You ever visit uh, Dr. Cancel or Dr. Pacino? I'm not very far away and we're in Canada, but Newfoundland and Canada, which is probably, a, I'd say, the flight's probably two hours, two and a half hours, probably, from New York City. But uh, yeah. But uh, thank you so much for, for doing this podcast. It's fascinating yeah. stuff. Music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound, www.bensound.com.